and amen. You may take your seats this morning. Can we give a little hand to the band this morning? It's, um, I don't know that there's anything quite like worship. It is, uh, it's absolutely magnificent, and it's, it's so awesome that we get to come together in one place like this, and we get to declare God's truth in unity together. Um, there's something very powerful about that. I was saying to the youth on Wednesday night that specifically when you are not sure with what to pray, then worship is a little bit like a cheat code. It's like a, it, it just puts you in a position where you can allow somebody else's cry to become yours. And when you're doing it in unison with other brothers and sisters in Christ, all of a sudden something that seems so simple becomes so significant and becomes so powerful. So um, I thank you guys for that this morning. It is so awesome to spend time in the presence of the Lord. Okay, so we are continuing on our journey in regards to feelings. Um, have you guys been checking yourself in the week? <laughs> I have come to the realization that I am exactly the culprit Chris has been talking about all this time. Um, every time asks, if somebody asks me how I'm doing, I respond with, okay, fine, good. Um, and then immediately I go, no, those are lies. That's not really how I'm feeling. But if I had to tell you how I was really feeling, we would be here for half the day. So let's just stick to okay for now. Um, but here's what we're going to do today. I want us to take another look at the feeling wheel. Let's throw it up there if we've got it. Um, this little wheel had a lot to do with the series we're in. Um, a bunch of the smartest minds in the world got together, pondered this wheel, and we started putting this, these, the series of messages together. And Chris said something in week one, and I'm trying desperately not to contradict what he said in week one, um, but I'm going to say something that he might get a little bit mad about. Mad is a feeling, I think. Um, but Chris said in week one that there is no such thing as good or bad feelings. Remember that. There are just feelings. They're not necessarily good or bad, but I will say that as I look at the wheel, I think we can all agree that some of these feelings are more desirable than others. Is that a good way of putting it? I think it is. Um, so Chris actually pointed out in week one that that little glad sort of sliver of the pizza there. Is that a pizza? Yeah, I think it's a pizza. It slices. That little sliver over there has the, the feelings that we would ascribe to being positive feelings. Those are the feelings we look at and we go, man, if anything, those are probably the feelings we would want in our life. So what we're going to do is over the next two weeks, we're going to look at gladness. We're going to have part one and we're going to have part two. And today what I'm going to do is, is I'm specifically going to jump into calm, content, secure, hopeful. I decided that I would preach the message about the things that I am the most not, uh, calm, <laughs> content, secure, and hopeful. Um, but I think we can all agree as we look at those feelings on that board that those are positive feelings. Those are the feelings that most of us would desire to have. But what I want to do today is, is I want to take a look at what happens when we experience positive feelings connected to negative things. Negative feelings or feelings that are not so desirable at times can be the most appropriate. For example, if you have lost a loved one, it is perfectly appropriate for you to feel sad, for you to feel angry even, for you to go through a period of mourning. And we will dive into that later in the series. But there are times where we are going to feel certain feelings attached to certain things that are actually very destructive things. And I want to tell you that is probably the most dangerous place you can get yourself in. One of the most dangerous things that can happen to you is you start to feel positive about things that are going to affect you in a very negative way. Um, a good way for me to summarize this is in Homer's Odyssey, uh, Odysseus has his men strap him to the mast of his ship and plug their own ears with wax. This is so that none would be able to hear the reach of the sirens' attempts to lure them to their deaths with their sweet song as they sail past. 
You've heard the story. You know the story of the sirens singing such beautiful, alluring, captivating songs that the sailors get so enraptured by the feelings and the beauty of what's going on that they actually sail right into their death. Um, the great theologian, Cheryl Crow, uh, <laughs> said it this way, and I changed the lyrics a smidge to be uh, Christian appropriate, but she said it this way, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad, right? Makes sense. But then she says this, this is where she gets deep, if it makes you happy, then why the heck are you so sad, Right? If it makes you happy, if it makes you feel good, surely it can't be that bad for you. But here you are doing all the things that make you feel happy, but somehow still you're actually very, very sad. And that's really exactly what we are going to dive into today is this. Good feelings connected to bad things will seduce us into destruction if we are not careful. Good feelings connected to bad things or destructive things can actually lead us to a very dangerous place if we are not careful. Feelings can be a great indication of where it is we're at in life. It can also be one of the most deceitful things we're ever going to encounter. And this is why we always have to make sure that our feelings is not the thing we stand on, but God's Word and God's truth is ultimately what we run our lives on. So what I want to do today is, is we're going to take these four sort of primary feelings connected to gladness, and we're going to take a look at them, and we're going to take a look at when they are inappropriate or when they are dangerous. So the first one we want to look at this morning is the feeling of calm. Calm, as defined by the dictionary, is not feeling nervous, angry, or other strong emotions. I can honestly tell you that calm sounds amazing. Does it not? Give me calm. Put it directly into my veins with a drip attached to it. I want some calm in my life. I can honestly say that I think being calm is probably one of the most desirable feelings that we can ever feel or experience. And according to the dictionary, when we really look at calm, calm in a lot of ways is the absence of other strong feelings or other strong emotions. So how is it at all possible that being calm is ever a negative thing or ever a bad thing? The feeling of calm is dangerous when it leads to apathy concerning lost and hurting people. The feeling of calm is a dangerous feeling when it leads to apathy or it leads to non-action when it comes to the lost and hurting people in our world. Come with me to Luke 19 verses 41 to 44, and it's speaking about Jesus, and it says this, as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he wept over it. Jesus felt overwhelming emotions as he looked at the city of Jerusalem and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus, as he travels, looks at Jerusalem, and he sees lost and hurting people. Jesus knows that he will be rejected, but Jesus also knows that he is the only way to true life and to abundant life. So as Jesus looks out at the city, and as Jesus sees a whole bunch of people that will eventually reject him, his heart is broken, and he is overwhelmed with emotions as he starts to cry. John 1 verse 11 says, He came to which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus' heart breaks for the unsaved. His heart breaks for the lost and the hurting. Jesus is not calm when it comes to those who do not know him. He is overwhelmed with emotion. 
The original Greek word for Christian is actually Christianos, which comes from two Greek words, Christ and Chin. The word Christ means anointed and Chin means little. So the word Christian literally means little anointed ones or little Christs. I want to tell you this morning that if Jesus' heart breaks for those who don't know him, then as a church, we are called to also be in a place where our heart breaks for those who don't know him. As the body of Christ, we are called to reach the poor, not only the poor in spirit, but the poor in flesh. Ask the poor, they will tell you who the Christians are, Gandhi said one time. Church, we can't be calm when it comes to a world that is hurting and lost and broken, but we need to get to a place where our hearts break the same way God hearts break for those. I, um, I said this to Linda a while back, and um, I'll, I'll say it now too. I, I've, I've given this a lot of thought actually. We, we can get very, what's the word I'm looking for? In church sometimes we can get very idealistic um, and we can make statements that sound great on a Sunday it doesn't play that great, though, Monday through Saturday, because on a Sunday, it's easy for me to put on a, a fairly well-fitting jacket and say a whole bunch of things and for you to say amen back. But when it comes to actually living this out, it can get messy, it can get ugly, it can get very confusing very quickly. I want to tell you that when it comes to actually reaching the poor in spirit and reaching the poor in flesh, it can be a very messy business very quickly and one of the things that I've realized about myself is, um, and I'll just confess to you right now, I've realized that the person I actually want to help is the person that looks like me. No, it's true. It's really true. I'm getting deep and philosophical here, so just hang on to your, your bootstraps. But I fundamentally believe that when we say we want to help those less fortunate than us, what we're saying is, is I want to help me, but I want to help me who just hasn't put it together yet. If we had to be honest with ourselves, we don't want to help those that have made decisions that we would never make, that hold beliefs that we don't hold, that do things that we would never do, that act in ways that we would never act. The truth is, is that when it comes to helping the poor, very often we actually have this idea of, I'll help me, but I don't know if I'll help the person that's completely different to me. Why does this become problematic in 2022? I'll tell you why. Because never before do I believe have we been taught in media, um, all over the place, we are being taught that if someone looks different to you, they are your enemy. <laughs> we are not taught any longer that there's such a thing as we all look different and we all are different and we're all unique with our own things. We are fundamentally being taught that if we think and act different, we're actually enemies. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. When Jesus cries for the lost and the hurting in Jerusalem, he is literally crying for the people that are going to crucify him a week later. He's crying for the people that are not just have a different opinion to him. He's crying and he's broken for the people that will literally crucify him. I don't know if there's anything more spectacular than the moment Christ is hanging on the cross and he says, Father, the very people that are spitting on me and mocking me and beating me, I pray that you forgive them, for they do not know what it is that they do. So church, this morning when we speak about reaching the poor, it's easy to say yes and amen, but in reality, it's a very difficult thing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, I think it's impossible. I actually think it's impossible, and I think when it comes to really having a heart to reach the poor, it cannot be an obligation thing. It has to be a compassion thing. Can't be an obligation thing. And if you read the Gospels and you see how Jesus does things, it never says that as Jesus was walking, he got moved by obligation. <laughs> and then he healed the person. Never says that. You never see Jesus walking, and as he walks past the man in need, Jesus feels guilty because he heard a sermon on Sunday, so he turns around and does a half-hearted thing. Never says that. It says Jesus is moved by compassion. His heart breaks for the lost, and it's in that space of compassion that Jesus reaches the poor, reaches the lost, the hungry, and the broken. So I would say this to you this morning. 
If you are feeling completely complicit or calm around reaching the lost, that is not a good feeling to have. But I don't think the answer is for you to put this on your to-do list and to rush out here and to try to be that person. Rather, what I think is appropriate is for us to sit here this morning and go, Holy Spirit, I pray that you open up my heart. I pray that you give me a heart. Actually, let's do that right now. Father, I want to thank you this morning just for who you are, Lord. Father, I thank you that you did not give up on me. I thank you, Lord, that when I was your enemy still, you saw me, you loved me, and you reached me. Father, I thank you for the countless people you sent across my path that loved me in spite of me, Father. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, I pray that you will give us your heart, your compassion, and your desire for lost people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's move on here. The next feeling is a feeling of being content. To be content is to have a level of satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction, but I try, but I try, but I try. Once again, I would say that this is an incredible feeling to have in a world that is never satisfied with anything. Let's be honest. We're never content. We're never satisfied. And I am the chief sinner, I've come to realize. Um, There's just never satisfaction. So the reality is, being in a place where we are actually satisfied and we are actually content, I believe is actually a very godly thing. And I want to show you a portion of Scripture where this is extremely positive. Philippians 4, verses 11 to 12, Paul speaking, listen to what he says here. He says, I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content. Come on, Paul. Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned that the secret of being content in any and every situation, what, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want, Paul is saying that he is satisfied he is, he is content, whether he has a lot, whether he has a little. And Paul then says he's learned the secret to being content in every situation. But I did not give you what Paul says. Do you want to see what he says, what the secret is? Come, come with me. One more. And you know this one very well. It's on the boots of every football player. Philippians 4, verses 13. Paul says, here it is. Here's the secret to being content. Whether, and it's actually ironic. Whether I score the touchdown or not, actually, I am content, hallelujah. You might be cut from the team, but you can be content with the Lord. (laughs) Philippians 4 verses 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So Paul is speaking about the fact that it doesn't matter what life throws at you, he has learned to be content in his relationship with Christ. So then when I want to talk this morning about where is it negative to feel content, I've got, to, I've got to stride carefully this morning because the last thing on earth I want is for this to be a life improvement seminar or a self-help seminar or a 15 steps to a better you seminar. That's not what the gospel is all about. But, le- but let me tell you what I think this morning. Here it is. The feeling of contentment is dangerous when it is connected to being mediocre. The feeling of contentment is dangerous when it's connected to being mediocre. I, um, I want to clarify this morning what I mean by that statement. I think when we think success in our culture, we immediately have a picture of what it looks like. I want a house in the suburbs somewhere. It needs to be big enough that I don't have to do too much yard work, but not too small, that I can't have a big pool. I want an eagle to just swoop every morning majestically past my swimming pool while I sip on coffee. Um, there is this idea we have of what this good, perfect life is. When I speak about mediocrity this morning, I am not speaking about chasing that Because Paul says clearly, I have had a lot and I have had little, but I am content with what I do have. But here is what we don't see in Paul. Paul is not satisfied living a life where he is simply surviving. Paul is not living a life where he goes to work, gets a McFlurry, sits on the couch and watches the Kardashians every weekend, the whole weekend, right? Paul is driven to live a life that glorifies Jesus. 
And because of his drive, because he is so driven to live for Christ, that is the reason at times he has a lot, and that is the reason at times that he has a little. But Paul says, I'm not satisfied with simply being mediocre when it comes to my calling in Christ. I will do whatever it is that I need to do to live out the call God has placed on my life. And I'll be honest with you this morning, I have too many conversations with people where they're in the same sad position they were in a million years ago. I understand it. I don't want to undermine it. I understand we go through seasons. I understand that there's times in your life where you have to do what you've got to do. I've been there. I understand it. But I want to say to you this morning that there is more to your life. There is purpose in your life. God has called you into something spectacular. I heard a preacher say this once, and it stuck with me. He said, if we were simply called to be saved, we would all drop dead the day we were saved. (laughs) Wouldn't that be a sight? Come to the front, bang. (laughs) Actually, I would love to run that church, Lord. So I'm just putting, putting that out there. Easy to shepherd dead people. But listen to this. What does it look like? How do we jump into our calling? What does it look like to embrace the call God has for us? 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without crumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And this gives us such a beautiful picture of the purpose and the call that God calls all of us into. You're not called simply just to survive, but you're called to make a difference. I, um, as I was preparing this message in the week, one of the things that I thought of was, well, this sounds very churchy. If I'm sitting in the congregation this morning and I am working in the, in the marketplace and I'm not a church guy, I'm hearing this and I'm going, Pastor, that sounds very churchy. I'm in the real world. I deal with real issues. I deal with real people. I have a real job. Um, And I love what you're saying. It sounds very flowery, but I've got other problems. You hear what I'm saying? I want to say this to you, though. The crux of this this morning is, is that we're called to serve one another and we're called to love one another. One of the shows that uh, I've recently picked up is Undercover Boss. Have you seen this show? (laughs) They'll take a poor CEO and they'll dress him up in the most ridiculous garb you've ever seen ever, like the most ridiculous outfit. And then they'll take him and they'll put him in sort of the lowest sort of area there is in the company. Then he works with people. He can't do the basics. They all make fun of him. Um, And inevitably, every episode of Undercover Boss, this happens. I'll save you seasons of watching it. Every episode, this happens. At some point, the boss comes across a person that's earning, you know, kind of 10 bucks an hour, is over life, hates the job, hates everything. And at some point, while the boss and the employee are interacting, the employee's like, I'm going to be honest with you, chief. I hate this job. I kind of hate people. The customers are the worst, and I don't want to be here. And then there's this existential moment where the boss goes outside beside the dumpster and the camera's on him, and he's in tears because he's like, this is just not what I had in mind. This company was was birthed out of a desire to help people. It's about people. It's not about managing a warehouse. It's about people. And it's interesting because right at the core of even success in the secular world lies a heart for people. It's about people. It's about loving people. Let me ask you a couple of questions here. What passion has God placed in your heart that has been there forever, but it's just been dormant. What is in there? What selfless thing is he calling you into? Let me ask you this question. What would you have to give up to pursue God's calling on your life? Let me ask another question. What backward steps do you think you need to take in order to actually move forward with the Lord? I think life has become just comfortable enough 
to lull all of us into contentment when it comes to the wrong things. He's called you to bigger things. Let's ask him to reveal to us exactly what that is. Let's move on here. Next one. Uh, next one on our list is security. And this is a really good one. Who does not want to feel secure? I think all of us do, and I think it's a great one. Listen to this. To feel secure means to be confident and safe. Isn't that a beautiful connection right there? Confident and safe. I want to show you something from a story that you know very, very well. Come with me to Judges 16, 18 to 20. And um, we know Samson, and we know that this guy is very, very strong. We know that no army can defeat this guy. He has got superhuman, supernatural strength. Um, he's like me 20 years ago, good-looking, strong, energetic. <laughs> um, but he decides to get into a relationship with Delilah, which he should not be doing. It is sinful before the Lord for him to be in this relationship with her, but he decides that he's going to go for it anyways. And look at what happens here. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, I want you to think about that word security again, confident and secure, right? Confident and secure. After putting him to sleep in her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Here it is this morning. The feeling of security is dangerous when it is rooted in our sinful actions. The feeling of security is dangerous when it is rooted in our sinful actions. At some point or another, you dived into a sinful behavior or a sinful action in your life because of one of two reasons. The first one is because sin is pleasurable. It feels good. Da, na, 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 na. Hebrews 11, verses 25. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Sin is going to feel good for a moment. So for some of us, we have developed sinful behaviors in our life because it feels good. For others of us, we have developed sinful behaviors in our life because for a moment in time, it served as medicine in your life. For a moment in time, it was the thing that made the bad feelings go away. But here is what happens if we're not careful. If we're not careful, just like Samson with Delilah, we can get to a place where these actions and these habits are in our life for so long without consequence that we just start to get very comfortable with it. As a matter of fact, we get secure in these behaviors. As a matter of fact, we get quietly confident in these behaviors. But here's the danger with getting security from our sin. Just like with Samson, What's going to happen is, is one day you will find yourself asleep, confidently, quietly in that sin, and before you know it, you're going to wake up in a world of trouble, because it is going to catch up with you eventually. I want you to know that if you are feeling security in your sinful behavior, that is a very dangerous place to be. One of the things that does not always help the situation is um, we'll come to church and we'll hear a message where the pastor gets up and says, God loves you, God's got grace for you, all the rest of it. And then if you're not listening properly, you walk out of here and you go, perfect. He actually says that God's got grace for me. Therefore, what he's saying is, is God is cool with my secret, quiet little thing that I'm doing, and it's all good, I'm good, God's good, everybody's good. I can just quietly and confidently keep on doing what I'm doing. I want to tell you this morning that the grace of God is not a license to stay where you are, but the grace of God is there to move you out of captivity. 
The grace of God is not a gift voucher to stay in prison another night. That's not what it is. The grace of God aggressively hatches a plan to break into prison, to get a hold of you, and to get you out of prison. Because it doesn't matter how good the prison cell feels. I get it. You're still in a prison cell, and that's not what God's desire is for your life. Come with me to Romans 6, verses 5 to 14. Um, This is a juicy portion of Scripture I'm going to give you now. I'm giving you a multivitamin year of biblical proportions. This thing is packed with omega-3s. Everything you need is in this. Um, Even a little bit of apple cider vinegar in here. Okay, this is good for you. Um, Check this out, Romans 6, verses 5 to 14. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives in God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. Listen to this this morning. This is key. This is crucial. Verse 14 is unbelievable. Listen to what it says here. For sin shall no longer be your master. Why? Because you are not under the law anymore but you are under grace. Hallelujah. We are set free by grace. And uh, two things I want you to take from that. Just just nibble on that this week. Just munch on it. Just have it on your phone. But verse 7, it says clearly, listen to this, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. God has a desire for freedom. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be set free. And then verse 14 tells us so beautifully and so clearly that it is His grace, it is His love, it is His mercy, it is His forgiveness that sets us free. Let us not become secure in the sin that has maybe become a part of our lives. So last one I want to look at this morning is this. And this is a difficult one to find negativity around, but this is my job. I find negativity everywhere, so I I managed to do it this week, but I want to look at the last one, and it is hopefulness, hopefulness. I don't think that there is anything that is more beautiful or more incredible than hope, but I think that that is also partially the problem with hope. Hope is exceptionally powerful, and if hope is placed into the wrong things, it can be absolutely detrimental to your life. So there's two things that I fundamentally want to place my hope into. Um, (laughs) As I live this life in my moments of weakness, there are two things that I tend to do, two places I tend to put my hope. I'm going to give them to you. Hopefully you struggle with the same thing. But the first one is this, the first place we should not put our hope. If your hope is in this, your hope is misplaced, and that is your idea of what the future should be. Oh, man, we're such good planners, aren't we? Little planners. We make our little plans. Listen to this, Proverbs. And before you get too judgmental, yes, I'm not organized, but I do have the occasional goal and plan. So whatever, don't look at me with those eyes. Proverbs 19, verses 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart. (laughs) I love how the Bible says this. Oh, boy, you got lots of plans. Good job, little Johnny. Um, Lots of plans. But it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. We've got many, many plans, and we've got many, many things. But I'm telling you right now that if your hope is placed in your vision of the future, 
you're going to find yourself in a very sad place. Our hope cannot be in our idea of what the future is. Rather, our hope has to be placed in Christ. Whether I have a lot, whether I have little, whether it's easy, whether it's difficult, whether I move into that cul-de-sac or don't, whatever happens, I am content in Christ. I am not hopeful in my own ideas of what the future holds. I I can tell you right now that the older I get, the truer this becomes. I remember at one point, Linda had this bucket list thing that she wanted to do. I'm going to be real with you. I kind of knew it was ridiculous right out the gate, but you you play along as you do. But she wanted to ride horses on the beach. (laughs) This was her idea, right? I was going to look like Fabio. I was going to grow my hair out. I was going to take my shirt off. You know, I was just going to have sort of ripped jeans and just ride this majestic horse on the beach. And we were going to find this beautiful place and picnic. And I won't tell you the rest of the story, but this is sort of the vision that she had. And I'll never forget in Cape Town, we finally found a place that do a romantic horse ride on the beach with your partner. So we found this place at a discount of... (laughs) So Linda gets the majestic stallion. They give her that horse. I'm not lying to you when I say this to you. I think they overbooked or something. I got the fattest horse I've ever seen (laughs) on the face of the planet. I got a pregnant horse named Madonna. Okay, that's the horse (laughs) they gave me, right? So anyways, Linda's on her horse. I'm on my horse. We get to the beach. As we get to the beach, the guy... Uh, Talio or Geronimo or whatever he screams, off they all go in slow motion. And my pregnant horse is like, bro, I ain't going nowhere, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm like Jesus on the donkey in the beach. <laughs> Kids are making fun of me. Everybody's making fun of me. I don't look like Fabio. Don't feel like Fabio. Next thing in the distance, I see Linda's horse leap. Linda flies off of her horse, <laughs> does 15 cartwheels, flat bang into the surf with her face. Um, it was the worst, weirdest experience ever. We finally get all our horses to the big. Look at the beautiful view out there. And as we stand, the horse in front lifts its tail. And I'm like, there's a waterfall of all kinds of nasty <laughs> coming out of there. And uh, afterwards, I just said to Linda, I'm like, do you feel fulfilled? Because that was... <laughs> Let's just go home, have McFlurries, and uh, watch Judge Judy. How's that sound? Um, second thing, second thing that you just can't put your hope into is, and I mean, this is very closely tied to the first one, is you, your ability. I'm just going to muscle my way through this thing. I'm just going to figure this thing out. I'm just going to apply myself. Again, in the same way I realize that my plans are terrible, the older I get, the more I realize that there's not a week that goes by where I don't do something where at the end of the week I go, So that was really weird, how I responded to that. That was really weird, what I said. Um, I didn't want it to play out that way at all, but it did. We cannot place our hope in ourselves. Romans 7, verses 15 to 20, you know this portion of Scripture because I've read it before, but it's so good, and I love it so much. This is Paul the Apostle, and this portion of Scripture for me reminds me a little bit of when you're watching golf, and one of the PGA Tours uh, golfers just slices one into the woods or into the water, and you're like, Yes, they're human, right? Listen to what he says here. I do not understand what I do. For for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now I do what I do not want to do. It is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And Paul is essentially saying here that we can't do this in our own ability, in our own strength. It's got to be Christ in us and through us. The feeling of hopefulness is dangerous when it is in our plans and our abilities. So the last question we need to answer today is this. 
Where should our hope be? Colossians 1, 27 to 29. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in which is Christ in you, the hope of our glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonish, and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so purposefully works in me. So where should our hope be this morning? Our hope should be in Christ because He is our only hope of a future. He is our only hope of glory. He is our only hope of salvation, peace, security, and contentment. Stand.